Alex bounced from Turkey to Russia and Yugoslavia, and on to Tunisia, Morocco, and Hungary, picking up work, he says, wherever he could find it. I've been picking grapes, been working on farms, you know, painting houses, working in restaurants. I've washed so many dishes. People used to joke that I was the dish technician. I got to tell you, there are going to be those people who are not your fans listening to this who will say, give us a break. If he didn't like the life, give yourself up. Face the music. You're not above the law. I wasn't trying to get away with anything. It sounds crazy, but I was trying to get justice in its bizarre way, but I... I don't belong in jail for 15 years for something I didn't do. Back in Connecticut, the Kellys were certain the FBI was watching their every move. For years, I never even mentioned his name. You didn't mention your son's name in the house? We didn't want to put him at risk. So you lived your lives in complete paranoia? Yep. It wasn't that we were <clears throat> afraid for ourselves. It was just that we didn't want anybody to know anything or have any leads on where he might be, although we didn't know ourselves because he was on the move all the time. Sooner or later, the FBI knew. Alex would contact his parents. Again and again, they came around to the Kellys, always with the same questions. You sure you don't want to tell us what's going on? We understand. It's time. It's going too long. You can't stay out there forever. Did you get any response? They didn't talk. They didn't give us clues. There was no dialogue. There was nothing. In fact, the Kellys had worked out an elaborate, hidden system of communicating with their fugitive son, with covert phone calls and mail drops. It was a secret life that began when Alex first contacted them eight months after his escape, and they called him back on a pay phone. You know what it's like to put $18 worth of quarters in a telephone? It's crazy. You wouldn't Shaking. talk to him on your phone? Oh, no way. No way. We assumed that everything was bugged. We lived like that for years. I did everything I could to tell them that everything was all right, don't worry about me. I'm fine. You didn't really tell your parents what it was really like? Of course not. I don't want to make them worry. You know, I wasn't going to tell them about the nightmares, about being feelings of being chased. Feelings he had for good reason. There were too many close calls. One of them in 1989, Alex's third year on the run, on a train crossing from Switzerland into West Germany. One of the border guards checked Alex's passport number on a handheld computer. He looked at it and he said, you're wanted in America. And I said, it's a mistake, what do you mean? And they said, all right, we'll have to check this out. Remarkably, when they went off to do that, they forgot to take Alex's passport with them. Alex grabbed it and took off. And I was going through cars and cars, and the train is moving, and I was trying to open the doors to jump off the train, but the train doors all lock. Anyway, the train finally stopped to let another train go by on the track. So I opened up the door, and I jumped down an embankment, and I rolled down into this farmer's field. I couldn't believe it. For the FBI, Alex's life on the run was an embarrassment, and his capture a priority. The passport is good, but the plane is not good. They had Interpol alert authorities in 176 different countries. To date. And in the U.S., they turned to the television program America's Most Wanted. If you've seen Alex Kelly, call us now at 1-800-CRIME-88. FBI agents working the Kelly case are waiting for your calls. Every one of the phone calls that placed him overseas was either at a ski resort or saw them in a, maybe some swimming club or whatever. Uh, either it's winter sports or summer sports. That's what he was doing, recreational things. In fact, Alex was living the life of a ski bum, working when he had to, skiing when he could. Filmmaker and photographer Gary Bigham spent several winters with Alex. He was just there, like everyone's here. You know, you ski during the day, one or two nights a week, you go out and have a couple beers with the friends. and hang out and go home and wake up and go ski and do it again. Alex came often to the French Alps, to Chamonix, 
a chic resort with terrain that lures daredevils from all over the world. And Alex Kelly was among the most daring. And those were like the only times that I could forget all my troubles. So when you were hanging your body out over the line, you had peace of mind? It was a time when I just didn't worry about when everything was clear. It was just I had a task at hand, and I would do it. And I wouldn't think about the rest of the world, about everything behind me, about everything. It was pretty liberating. 1991, four years after Alex had disappeared and the Kellys had grown more bold. They were now willing to risk everything to see their son again. And they would see him in Zurich, Switzerland. By now skilled at deception, they circled their way to the city's central train station, checking to see if they had been followed. We went to that train station and boy did we look around, thinking that everybody was the person that was going to close in. Do you remember seeing him? First time you laid eyes on oh, him? Oh yeah. Yeah. He says, hi, Mom. I looked at <laughs> They look so much older. They look so gray. I didn't know if it was the stress of all that was happening back here, or if just four years they had gotten older. For the first time, it hit me that, wow, they might, wow, they might die while I'm gone. As it turned out, it was Alex's older brother, Chris, who died while he was gone from a drug overdose. At the funeral, the Kellys endured the presence of some uninvited observers, the FBI. I don't know what their motivations were, really. Whatever they were, as far as I'm concerned, they were sick. You took it as harassment? Well, I don't believe that they were expecting to find Alex. Mm -hmm hiding behind one of the headstones. We have an obligation to find Alex Kelly. The guilt, the hurt, the anger, the love, all the emotions that the Kelly family have should be funneled to Alex Kelly and not the people in law enforcement. He's been everywhere. Now the FBI decided to push even harder. Three more times they ran Alex Kelly's mugshot on America's Most Wanted. Search continues for Alex Kelly. Three more times, the FBI came up empty-handed. Nothing was moving for you? Not actively, not, not like what we wanted to happen. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you were hearing something here and something there. Right. He, he was really a ghost. You weren't able to come across him anywhere. We knew he was out there. We knew he was visible. We just couldn't find him. The FBI had no idea how visible Alex Kelly really was. In his third winter on the run, Alex was relaxed enough to play a cheerful ski bum in a film shot by his old skiing friend, Gary Bigham. Alex said, uh, yeah, sure. I don't know why, but yeah, why not? He didn't seem at all like he was trying to hide anything. He didn't seem nervous about people. Not at all, no. The sportswear company Patagonia even used one of Alex's photos from the film in a 1991 catalog. And as for the film's credits, Alex, as always, went by his own name. Well, I am Alex Kelly. You're also a fugitive. And if you go by the name of Alex Kelly, eventually somebody's going to come by who knows Alex Kelly. I bumped into people, and they'd say, you're Alex Kelly. And I'd say, Nay, you weren't Alex Kelly, you were coming from Sveria. <laughs> you know, I would speak another language or something. I would try my best to get out of there, or else I'd say, no, I don't understand, and walk away. The Kellys, too, were feeling more at ease now. They say they visited Alex three more times and took pictures of their time together, pictures that years later would come back to haunt them. <laughs> 